Um, needless to say that Alia and I have been fueled by our love for Arabic and are fortunate to be joined by three brilliant voices that were not only willing to go on this journey with us, but they actually say, share the same love for Arabic and have been pretty thoughtful and intentional about how and why they use Arabic, as well as the legacy they're leaving behind with their work. Um, join me to welcome or in welcoming our first panelist, Pascal Zorbi, who's an internationally renowned Lebanese type and graphic designer of many superpowers. Besides founding 29 Letters Digital Type Foundry, which I must admit, Alia and I had so much fun playing around with in the past couple of weeks, uh, generating different Zoom backgrounds and playing with the fonts. Pascal is a design educator and author whose creative journey has inspired us firsthand and many others, I'm sure. Based in Madrid, he pulls inspiration from his cross-cultural approach to type and media, which is ever present in his work. Uh, more than anything, we felt that there's an honest practicality to his voice that is both progressive and authentic at the same time, especially in the way he treats Arabic. He's developed an outstanding collection of contemporary typefaces that continue to revive and reimagine Arabic today, and we're very happy to have him with us tonight. We're also joined by um, Saudi-born Lujain Abu Faraj, who's the co-founder and creative director of Two Thirds Design Studio, which we love. Uh, she's also the co-founder and previous design director of Wetad Magazine and the founder of Aquan, which we'll be specifically talking a lot about today. Um, Lujain's deep journey, which on one hand is synonymous with visual design, Arabic typography, and calligraphy, has taken an interesting dimension in 3D, where she's ventured into experimental design projects that have been catered to this region to curate experiences and solve problems in new and reimagined ways. Um, you'll all see today that she's all heart and that she brings that to her work very honestly and very genuinely. So thank you, Lujain, for being with us tonight. And last, but certainly not least, we're joined by Maryam Wissam al dabbagh who's a writer, a researcher, and co-founder of Ru'ya Consultancy, which specializes in cultural communications and public relations. Uh, Maryam does not know this, but she's inspired me from the moment I met her a few years ago, because she struck me as a force of nature who will contribute tremendously to the arts and cultural scene in the region. And she's done exactly that, especially in the way she has been breaking boundaries and filling gaps relating to how we express, communicate, and engage creatively. Um, her insight when it comes to language dynamics will surely be enriching to all of us tonight. And it's a result of her ongoing research and the different editorial and creatorial projects that she's been involved in. So thank you all three of you for being with us tonight. You can clearly tell that Alia and I are biased to our panelists and uh, we wanna jump straight into it. And perhaps we'll start with Maryam specifically. Um, I'm pulling you in because in our earlier conversations, as we were trying to unpack what's working, what's not working, what's missing when it comes to our creative process in Arabic, you shared something that re resonated with us rather deeply and you've been and we've been quoting you ever since which is Malakat al qalb bil arabi um, it was very difficult alia and i almost wanted to paint uh, to print it on uh, on on t-shirts and on caps and just arrive to it uh, arrive with those tonight but if you can elaborate a little bit more and get us started um, just share with us why and how is it that Malakat al qalb is bil arabi and actually lead us a little bit and share with us why Arabic has been so central to you in your work. And of course, we invite Lujain and Pascal to chime in afterwards because we'd love to know the role of Arabic in your work specifically and where you feel Arabic is missing from our creative process as a whole. Uh, thank you so much, Farah, for this uh, great introduction. I'm very humbled by your kind words, and I'm obviously honored to be with uh, a great team of panelists, uh, Pascal and Lujain. Le uh, Pascal, I obviously know of his work, uh, and Lujain is a really good uh, friend of uh, mine. Um, it's very difficult to explain Malakat al Qalb in English, um, pretty much because it really speaks about how the language is part of. The, relationship, the, the intense relationship between language and emotion and the emotional attachment we have to language and the linguistic attachment we have to emotions as well. Um, so um, my premise usually um, to answer your question, maybe your second question and maybe allude to my the first one is um, 
And um, yani I, I speak English very well. I write English very well. I'm a graduate of uh, both American and British education systems, not by choice. This is literally what we are presented with in the Arab world and outside. But, uh, but Anna, um, yani I learned al-hub, love. I learned cuisine, al-akil. I learned language, al-lugha. I learned religion and faith, al-deen. Um, I learned uh, everything in Arabic. Um, in my household. Uh, my, both my parents um, are extremely articulate. They're very eloquent. Uh, they listen to beautiful music, Arabic music. They read amazing history and literature in Arabic and in English. But the Arabic language was very prominent in the way that I was brought up. And obviously it became, it became my, truly my mother tongue. And when we say mother tongue, it has a very strong uh, relationship to the mother and the father and the family and however we define them. Um, but I but I did fall into the trap of thinking English is cooler. I was, I am the millennial generation that uh, I think Gen Z is now like hating on nowadays. So uh, I am the generation that saw, like that thought that, you know, speaking English is much nicer uh, than speaking Arabic. When I went to the American University here in the UAE, um, I was taken aback by this, um, this culture of openness um, that I thought didn't exist within the Arabic language. But also I am a child of wars. So the moment I opened my eyes, my home country, Iraq, was unfortunately under uh, either an invasion or a, a siege or a war, which also in a way amplified and intensified my need to reclaim my Iraqiness and reclaim my Arabic. Move back. Um, fast forward um, maybe five, six years, I found myself working in the arts and culture when I was probably 21. And I started realizing, a new, and that was at the very beginning. I and mean, we've had what, two, three exhibitions a year in the UAE. Um, I found myself um, noticing that all of our cultural production and artistic production, and I'm talking predominantly about Dubai because Sharjah is on a completely different league. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharjah has always been great in, in bilingual sort of outreach, if anything, Arabic outreach. But in Dubai, where I work, I found that most of our production was in English, and I found that to be a bit odd, uh, given that the artists were Arabs or the audience were half Arabs or, or, or. So I started some sort of an activist kind of uh, work where I would knock on doors and ask to translate for free. I would just mm -hmm. translate your text for free uh, until I realized I shouldn't do things for free <laughs> and I need to eat. <laughs> so I started uh, charging very minimal um, for my translation, which was not great, but it was good enough um, at the beginning. And I developed my practice. I moved on to do 100 jobs later on. And while also writing and translating on the side, for specific um, cultural spaces and artists and writers and curators. Um, until I realized you know, after 10 years of doing this research and developing my own glossary um, and reading so many texts in Arabic um, that I've actually developed a language of my own. So I started really truly writing in Arabic rather than just translating. So I would read the English text and I would write it in Arabic and specifically in the arts and culture and design. Um, and yeah, this is how I, I, I really think that the language, any language uh, are, can offer so much depth uh, and so much, a different perspective on any topic we talk about, specifically design. But what's interesting about writing about culture and art is that culture, design and art, design and art are languages on their own. So uh, design is a language. And al-fan, uh, well, art is a language as well, but a visual language. So how do you find, how do you balance between the literary and the visual and bring them together? And this is where my whole sort of, um, my strength and my weakness at the same time is, is investigating this relationship. But I'm a big supporter of Kulshi Arabi, um, and everybody, everybody that knows me knows that. We well, you know, I know, yes. Pascal and Lujain, we'd love to hear from you, but I see that you're both muted. So just to make sure that when you chime into the conversation, make sure that you're unmuted. We'd love to hear from you with regards to your work, um, the role of Arabic in your creative process, your creative output, and also where you feel Arabic is, what you feel Arabic is missing right, right now, if anything. 
Um, Pascal, should I go or do you want to go? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So, like um, Farah introduced earlier, I'm Saudi, um, but I didn't grow up in Saudi. So, I only lived in Saudi till I was eight. Um, while I was in Saudi, uh, my education was purely Arabic. Not only that, but I was actually in the class, like we had six classes in my grade. I was in the class that focused on Quran. That means by the time I was eight years old, I think I memorized five, five like parts of the Quran, which is a lot for a kid. You can see any word and I'll just tell you what it says. But my Arabic was really good. It was really, really good. My English was nothing. It was like, I barely spoke in English. We moved to Kuwait around that time and I went to an American school. The transformation, of course, is day and night. In Saudi, where I had like a class for handwriting, a class for tajweed, which is like how to read the Quran, a class for memorizing the Quran, a class for the rules of Quran. Like there were so many classes that I had in Arabic versus in, in Kuwait, it was just one class a day. Everyone's level was way below mine. And their handwriting was horrible. Like I'm not like dissing them, they know that. Like my friends used to know that and I was like the nerd in Arabic. I didn't study for Arabic for any Arabic class, any Arabic exam till the day I graduated and I was always a, an A student. Um, so it's not that I didn't like Arabic, but I just didn't feel like, I, I thought like I knew Arabic, you know? And I, I, I guess I also took it for granted. I studied in AUS in Sharjah. Um, and at the time there were no classes in Arabic again. And I was like shocked. I really wanted to design things in Arabic. When we interned, the client's work were usually bilingual and I didn't have any basis to work on it. So for my capstone project, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to do something in Arabic. I wanted to um, do something that represents me and where I come from. I'm originally half from Medina, half from Mecca. So visiting the holy sites was like ingrained in me since I was a little kid. We go every year, twice a year, if not more. Um, so I wanted to like do explore calligraphy and these holy places, I'm very spiritual. So like learning how to do that, I realized I know nothing. Like I realized my understanding in Arabic typography was extremely weak. I, I went to calligraphers, to classes and like really had to teach myself. And that's something obviously we brought up, we brought up to AUS and they worked on that and Pascal can tell you more about this probably. Yeah. But it became part of my, um, like it's something that I valued very much as a designer that I wanted to always show that Arabic can be cool. Cause I, I felt like people didn't think Arabic was cool. And I was shocked, like even in school, you know, Arabic was like, Ugh. like the EU class, the EU teachers, the EU whatever, everything like they didn't connect with it. But I felt like I want to make Arabic cool or like, you know, like I was always like, uh, I felt like Arabic was branded and I wanted to play around and make play my role as a designer and, and not do that. And I do that with Sad a lot of my co-founder in two thirds. Um, and then again, I became a mother eventually. Um, I'm a very nerdy person, as I mentioned. So I was like reading about like, kids and how to raise smart kids and what kind of, you know, like doing all my research. I didn't have anyone like any mother friends at the time. So I was like, okay, I need to figure this out. I need to be awesome. And all the resources, all the books I read were in English. So when it came to applying it so unconsciously, I applied them in English and I didn't realize the impact it would have on my kids. My kids spoke only English and I only realized that by the time they were three, four years old because I was applying all the tips like speak to your kids. It says speak to your kids this way. So I would speak to them this way, exactly like the book told me. But I didn't think you know, if I don't speak to them in Arabic, like it just never crossed my mind and it's insane. I realized the importance of awareness. Um, the importance of having tools and resources that can um, educate mothers and help mothers like read bo good books to their kids. And that's kind of my journey into Aquan and that's why I started Aquan. Um, I'll pass over the mic to us. <laughs> Hello, marhaba, keep going. Yes, Thank you for just next to Arabi. I know, I thought, and Maryam will as well. <laughs> Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be a part of the discussion. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think with me, I'm, I have a very ironic uh, relationship with Arabic, as most of you also maybe had. Uh, also in my childhood, I, I, I wasn't a big fan of Arabic. I, I had also a lot of problems with Arabic language at school. And I didn't actually uh, become uh, interested in the Arabic until I was at university and it was through the typographical aspect, it was through the visual aspect. So my, my entry point into the Arabic language was through the Arabic typography and calligraphy and not the other way around. 
um, but um, also um, from now, I, I always, especially when I left Lebanon and I living abroad and I speak less Arabic, I know now that Arabic is really part of me as a as a person, as a human being, and I always feel happier or more. I sound more fun as a person, or or my spirit is more at ease when I speak in Arabic. Like when I call back my friends, the my friends in Lebanon, or or I speak Arabic to someone. Or even when my kid that only now maybe knows only one or two Arabic words and he says one of them, I like start jumping of of uh, of happiness and and joy and and it's true that it is built in our DNA, we being Arabs. Uh, even even in my childhood, I don't I don't consider myself as uh, and like a proper Arab individual that learned Arabic properly or used Arabic. Uh, you know, in Lebanon, most of, of the families, they prefer to speak to their kids in French or English because maybe because we are a very small nation and they want us to be open that they always have in mind that Lebanon is small and we need to migrate to work or whatever, or we need to work with the, with the other nations in the world. And if you speak Arabic and French, we're better. And Arabic, yeah, if we know it, we know it. If you don't know it, nah, it's not important. But but actually, when I became at university, I know it's actually the opposite because all what defines me now as, as, a, as a working professional, as a designer, type designer, and as a person, I am what defines me is that I am an Arab and I know Arabic. And this is basically who I am now. Even if I am in Spain or I am in Dubai or I am in Beirut or anywhere I go or, or to any work I'm, I'm being involved in, I'm doing Arabic. Um, but the irony is that I'm not speaking much Arabic, especially now since I'm living, I'm, I'm living in Spain. And also, I, I don't read Arabic much. I don't write in Arabic. But all my work is Arabic. So there's this irony in my, in my being uh, and, and my, in my work. So yeah. I am, I'm, I'm drawing Arabic letters every minute of, of my life uh, for the past 15 years now. But as a language, it's not very present in my life. But yeah, this is... Isn't it so interesting how we, we seem to all have complex relationships to yeah. Arabic and there's, there's a lot of um, contradictions. Um, but I think like one of the things that we really wanted to do today in this conversation was to make these contradictions okay and to kind of approach Arabic from whatever angle is ours um, and kind of make it a little bit more comfortable, make our relationship with Arabic a little bit more comfortable. Um, as we were putting the series together and you guys started to hint at this, we started to, we kept asking ourselves, how much of our Arabness do we bring to the table as creatives when we approach a project? Um, and how can we be more intentional about bringing our whole selves to our creative work, including our Arab selves and our Arabic language, our Arabic cultures, um, formulating creative thought in Arabic from Arabic as a starting point, um, I'd love to hear from you guys about how to do that intentionally. <laughs> I see many it's, it's, a, it's a tough one um, for someone like me because I, I don't have, a, obviously I have a complex relationship with Arabic, but I don't have any tension towards using it. I can flip now to Arabic and promise you not to use an English word for the next hour, which Yanni is, which used to be extremely challenging for me, let's say 10 years ago. But now I'm very happy to, but ما عندي مشكلة, يعني I don't have a problem speaking بالعربي or, or speaking in Arabic, but I, 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 I do have, I've been reflecting a lot lately on this idea of the Arabness and, and language is one component of this Arabness. So Arabness is a culture. It's a, what Pascal just explained, like it's, it's ingrained in him. It's something that he, Yani exclusively works with, but he doesn't necessarily use the component of language on his day to day in his day to day Afwan. Um, but I was I've been I've been thinking a lot, and I have absolutely no conclusions. 
يعني and I'm not making any any conclusions. بس حتى with the way that we work, يعني uh, I want us to think a little bit about professionalism, right? This concept of professionalism, it's pretty much a Western construct, right? So it's uh, these are um, values and ethics uh, in a specific way uh, of how to conduct work or how to do a business um, interaction that we've inherited from the West. So you need to look like this. You cannot have curly hair. You have to tie your hair and you have to do this and you have to wear this and you need to wear a suit. And, and then, of course, it continues. Don't show emotions. Be, have a straight face. Don't indulge and don't do this and don't do that. And, and there has been an amazing movement back in the West as well of so, sort of countering this. Right. And saying that we need to resist these notions that were put by different people or by the others. And I, I'm now reflecting on this idea of Arabness and the way that we work. We're extremely generous with our emotions and with our, with, with our kind words and with our pleasantries. And they're not hypocritical. They're genuine. Um, we, we are known to be cultures that host, that love hosting. Right. Mudiafin bil Arabi. How, do, how does that translate to our day-to-day -day work, right? How does that translate to our professional um, sort of uh, yani, professional conduct? Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and language obviously is a big part of it, but I'm not going to write an email in Arabic to somebody who does not speak Arabic. That's just plain rude. Um, nor will I respond in English to somebody who wrote me an email in Arabic. As well, I find that also equally rude. But um, I'm, this is this is these are the thoughts that are coming in my head. I, now the things that I do is uh, I make my emails sound like exactly I do in Iraqi, but in English. So hello, Shonek, how are you? Inshallah, khair, everything is okay. And why not? But that's who I am, and that's what I believe makes a professional kind pleasant atmosphere within my in my culture so mm -hmm. that's one way of doing it the other thing that i want to say and it might sound controversial as arabs it's okay if we mispronounce english words it is yeah. our second language this obsession to have an accent that is super similar to an american or a british or a canadian or an australian is really unnecessary and i am always happy in a meeting when i don't know an english word and i would make it intentional that it is my second language. And the fact that I'm so eloquent in it is such a great thing. And you should applaud me and applaud anybody who masters a second or a third or a fourth language, right? So command this idea, this obsessive need and we pronounce everything like we hear it in the movies is, is not necessary. It's okay to mispronounce. And I also do not appreciate uh, all of these jokes about Arabs not pronouncing the P and the B. Yeah, but uh, so, so so what? The, and people who speak English can't pronounce kha and the and the, right? And the, but we don't. Yeah, we don't see. We, and and it's it's unfortunately coming from us. Yeah, Adi, Anna, Anna, I, some of my best employees do not pronounce the p. They're the best. They're the most intelligent, and they write fantastic emails. But it's not their first language. Who cares? So I feel like these little things that can re that I do that maybe release some of that tension that I have about this obsessive need to perfect two languages at the same time and navigate them so smoothly without falling. I don't know, Lujain, if you share this with me, but if I read a Riwaya Arabiya now, like a full-on Arabic novel, I will start stuttering in my English for the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. I'll be like, uh, uh, what, what is this word? Uh, you know, but then when I read full English, I'll start stuttering in my Arabic. Yeah. And it's just the way that the beautiful brain works of bilingual and trilingual people. So this is this is my take, which I don't know if it answers your question, but something I really wanted to say about pronunciation. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Mariam. Lejeune, yeah. do you want to share? No, I actually want you to repeat the question because I feel like <laughs> I lost it. Anna, <laughs> when I read my question or Parah? Parah. Alia, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Mariam. That was that was a really interesting perspective. So, uh, Lujin, we're talking about how much of our Arabness do we bring to the table in our creative work? Um, how much of our Arab culture? And I think Mariam looked at it from a professional perspective, like how much of our Arabness do we bring to our work as professionals? I'd love for you to kind of talk to us about it from a specifically from a creative angle, like how much of your Arabness do you bring 
to a creative project, not just in like in form, not just in using Arabic in form, but actually in the way you're thinking and your problem solving and the way you go about kind of approaching the project. So most of our projects in two thirds are client based and most of our clients are from the UAE and Saudi. Um, and our instinct is always to go back to roots whenever we start any research, like the roots of their story, the roots of similar stories in the region. So we're very, very, like we're very attached to the Arabness or the culture of, if, if it's connected to the project, obviously if it doesn't connect, then that doesn't make sense. But obviously when it, when it, when it does, then that's important. Also, there was a phase, I believe, like uh, with entrepreneurship um, in the UAE, it, the, in the UAE it passed, in Saudi, it's, we're still in the middle of it, where they love when a, when a brand looks like it's Mimbarra. Mimbarra means it's imported from outside the Arab world, they're brought in. So they want to look like Mimbarra, and they want to look like they're not Arab, and they're like uh, from Europe, and it's like, you know, but why, you know? And this phase happened in the UAE, and it's... And I feel like it's, it's, it's fading away. And now people are actually embracing that identity, what we have to bring into the table as Arabs. And we had that connotation that it's either, if it's Arabic, it's gonna be out this old school style, very heavy versus, you know, uh, if it looks like it's Mimbarra, then it's cool and young and, and, and people would want it. And it's more appealing to the general public. But I see this shifting, which is great. And I think us as designers will play a role on showing that it is possible and it's very much possible and actually can be an, is an advantage to have your own story to tell, to have your own identity built around like a new concept. You don't, you don't, although we're inspired by our roots, but you shouldn't use them as they are. You, you are refreshing them with the new story you're telling, um, with, with, the, with the new brand, with your, with your new concept and all of that. Um, so yeah, we have to balance. Like a lot of people think if it's Arabic, that means it's old. No, it still can be more. And we, can, we see this from the beautiful designs that have been shared here in the screenshot. Like, and, and online, like now a lot of new designers, even like seasoned designers are, are doing really amazing work that shows how awesome Arabic is. And now we get requests, mostly the clients that come to us, they come because they're like, we love your approach to bilingual design you make it work but i like that shift that's happening because we stand our grounds and we show our clients um what's the best way to approach these concepts and i think the intention shows in your work lejeune like your your intention to um bring arab you know arabic and your arabness to your projects it shows and i think that's what is seems to draw people to you pascal do you want to chime in here um, yeah, well, me, I am, as you know, I'm an Arabic type designer. Um, I also collaborate for our other scripts, but basically I'm the Arabic uh, designer. And basically all my work is based on the, on the Arabic language, uh, calligraphy, typography, and culture. Um, also as an educator, when I, when I, uh, when I was in Beirut and, uh, in the Emirates, when I taught, I always, uh, was teaching uh, typography classes and gave uh, like Arabic type design courses. And I was always uh, trying to give the, the idea that we as uh, Arab designers, we, we have this extra gift, uh, uh, which is the Arabic script, which is the Arabic typography. And this is what distinguishes us from all the other designers in the world. And if we really master it and we know how to use it, we, we can make a difference uh, in our community as an Arabic community and in the world as an Arab uh, designers. And uh, this is what always I think of as an Arabic type designer. Um, I need to master my language. I need to master my script to distinguish my work from all the other designers in the world. What, what, is, what is the difference between me and a, an American designer or a Japanese designer or Chinese designer? The only plus that I have or the only advantage that I have is that I know Arabic. And if I don't master it, it will be my biggest weakness. So why not master it? And why don't become the best in it? And that's always, I encourage my students to learn as much as possible about the Arabic language and the script. Uh, uh, sadly, so many students, they enter classes in, in Lebanon and in, in, in the Emirates where I taught that they don't know nothing about Arabic. Uh, but the happy part is that by the end of the semester, they 
either they become a lovers of Arabic or at least they know the basics of Arabic. And I always try to inject this love of the Arabic language and heritage and, and culture. And um, in my own work as a, as a designer, I feel that it's my responsibility to contribute to the Arabic uh, design community. And my contribution to this community is doing uh, professional proper Arabic typefaces. Um, and seeing is... people using them makes me so happy. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. Letting him know she's responding. Um, You're getting love uh, as a professor <laughs> here. <laughs> Ah, thank you. <laughs> Can you give it back, Pascal? Just I on was, that. I was teaching as, uh, since since I'm in Spain. It's been three years. I stopped teaching, so this is part of my identity. But now on hold, but I'm happy from time to time doing these lectures and workshops. Amazing. Just a quick reminder to everyone in the audience, feel free to ask any questions. Um, we have an amazing team who will be monitoring the chat. Hopefully we've got some time for a Q&A session at the end. We'd love to get to some questions. And a quick note to the panelists also, feel free to chime in as the conversation unfolds. I've been noticing that some of you um, mute yourselves after you're done. So you can feel free to keep yourselves unmuted if you want to. Building on what you guys have shared already, you've already touched upon the fact that language is so much more than just a vessel to express ideas. It's a window into a culture. It, you know, it tells us how we, it shows us how we think. It influences how we tell stories, how we connect with others, how we create long lasting um, relationships. Um, but if we wanna address the elephant in the room a little bit, we have to say that we have to admit that it's one of the most spoken languages worldwide with a big population of users. We're over 400 million Arabs. Um, it's the official language in over 20 countries. And here we are, um, no, A, having this conversation in English, and B, we've talked about um, how little content is available in Arabic online. I believe it was around 3% or something like that. Um, and I know in our earlier conversations, we've talked about the tools and the platforms that we as creatives are using that may have not been created with Arab users in mind. And I remember, for example, Eugene, you mentioned that one of your exercises that you've taken on was to, was to shift the uh, language settings on your phone so you, will, so you would navigate technology on your phone in Arabic just to get yourself a little bit um, more comfortable uh, with, with the language. And I, saw, and I also remember we've touched upon that with you, Pascal, and we talked about how certain, you know, how technology hasn't necessarily adapted um, early on and very quickly to Arabic. I mean, now we're playing catch up a little bit, and I know that it's not exclusive to Arab to Arabic. I know it's 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 a it's it's we share that concern and that struggle with other countries and other nations. But I'd love to hear from you guys, especially as creatives or Mediam, you are so active in the creative and cultural scene. You work with creatives. How do these tools and the, and the means that we're using? Um, empower us or hinder us to create in Arabic for Arabic, keeping in mind design tools, design education. Um, perhaps Pascal, you can start and let us know uh, what you think. Uh, yeah, as you said, the technology was, until a few years back, it was really behind and supporting the Arabic language and the Arabic script. Mm -hmm. And uh, this really affected the, uh, since since the computer age until the even before even during the typewriter during the printing press then we come to the computer and then the mobile all these technologies were built for the western uh, western script especially the the latin which is the english french etc and uh, the arab script was always suffering from that that's why we at at the beginning we saw this arabisi kind of chatting that we use for chatting so we use the english words to write the Arabic and we, we use the numbers seven, five and, and uh, two for the missing uh, phonetical sounds. And uh, also typographically, we were stuck for a while with very rigid kind of typefaces or, or fonts uh, because it was limited to the technology that only allowed us to make very rigid static kind of like mastery fonts, etc. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go deep in this because we don't have time, but the main idea is that uh, our, our cultures were always based on what the West is allowing us to do with it or, or how to communicate. And I think now 
bit by bit is starting to change and the technology is starting to catch up and the importance of the all global world that we're living in and all different languages and the cultures, they're starting to be very important. And now we see that, for example, major big companies like, like Google or, or others, they are now producing as much as possible fonts that support all the languages of the world. Uh, or other companies that are now, whenever they launch a certain brand or a certain design, they don't only do it in English. Uh, first, they, they also think of other languages and other scripts, and they work with international team all over the globe from experts from, from the Far East, from Middle East, from, from Europe and from the US to, to cater for all of this. So, so now the idea is, is now we are in a world that is much better than how it was before. It's going to be even better in the future where bit by bit, it's not only about what is Western and what is not Western. It's, it's, it's about what is the world about and what is the importance about all of it. And as you mentioned that the, so we have the, the Chinese or the, or, the, or the Mandarin and we have the English, we have the Arabic and we have the Spanish. These are the four mainly biggest scripts and languages used in the, in the world. And half, half of them, which is the, the Chinese and the Arabic, these don't use the Latin script. These yeah. use Chinese and Arabic. Yeah. And they are more than half of the, of the four more used uh, languages in the world. And this says a lot that for, the, so, for so many years, these scripts were, were somehow ignored. And now they are from the top supported languages in any kind of big technology platforms, which is a big, uh, which is a big difference. Um, so this is about technology. Uh, um, the, the other part of your question, I don't know what, what uh, we're talking about technology. anyways, I will leave it to Lujain and to Mariam now. <laughs> no, but I, I agree with you, Pascal. I, mean, I think this idea of looking at the internet as this infinite place of freedom of content and expression and that it's open to all and then to Matan and let's say place blame, uh, which you read a lot in articles that Arabs need to produce more content is, is not entirely true. Mm -hmm. uh, the internet is very late in catching up with languages of the world mm -hmm. and the, the linguistic digital divide is something that is of serious concern. Um, the relationship between language and the internet is now discussed in policy making. It is, it is something that is actually discussed in, in political forums and in strategy forums. So it is, it is a big question and we are playing catch up now. So it's not that any, any, we do produce content in Arabic, but it's unfortunately now if the language you speak is not a digital language or a language that exists in the digital world, does it exist, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we tend to forget that as outside of the screen, there are, we are producing literature, we are producing culture, we're producing science, we're producing mm -hmm. medicine, however and whatever we're producing. And this is another, as, as Pascal said, in a much longer and much larger conversation. But I just also wanna point out that we are now speaking in English in this session about the Arabic language. But if this session was being in Beirut, it's impossible that they would be speaking in English. In the Lebanese, and I've attended a lot of conferences um, through Zoom because of Zoom's gifts in the last year in Beirut. When it's about the Arabic language, they will speak in Arabic. And they're very, they're very open about the influences of the French and the English language into their language. If this session is now being held in Baghdad, it will be spoken in Arabic if it's indeed about the Arabic language and they're happy to speak in English about something else. But we have a problem here in, 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 in assuming audiences assuming our capabilities in listening to what these audiences speak, mm -hmm. um, and also always, always prioritizing English. And when we as cultural producers prioritize English, then we are part of the problem. Yeah. The number of people that speak Arabic in the world is huge. Yes, yeah. we are assuming that the audience that we want, not assuming, the audience that we want is the audience that speaks English. There is a responsibility, it falls on us as cultural producers, and it obviously falls on the larger institution and the larger, you know, like the establishment and the internet. And obviously, we are not producing enough content. I stopped in the recent years 
placing blames on the other and looking at myself. I know okay. what am I doing? How am I? How am I? And I have, I have, I have um, a circle of influence, guys. Even if, uh, I, okay, yes, I'm not an influencer, but I'm a micro influencer. I have you a thousand followers on. No, no, but in reality, I don't get paid for anything. Like if I, if I use a bottle of water now on my Instagram, nobody paid me for it, like influencers <laughs> do, <laughs> you know? But I'm not an influencer in that uh, very unfortunate traditional sense now. But, but the idea is we're all micro-influencers. Oh. And, and, and arguably even stronger than an influencer with, مثلا, let's say, a million followers and a million bots. Right. I always keep asking myself, I don't have an answer. Yeah, but just to build on what you're saying, the, the people you influence are the people you're any your sister, your your kids, your you know what I mean? You have their that's that's a start. Uh, and that's kind of what when it comes to my personal story, it's what woke me up about this is my kids. Like when I saw them not being able to speak English, I was like, okay, I have to set an example to them first. I can't just say, you know, and if I'm speaking English to other people or to them or so when, when, when I talked about technology and switching the language and, and my thing is it, it was because I realized I couldn't speak Arabic without speaking English too. Like I, I couldn't mm. find the words. The words would come to me in English before Arabic. Mm. So someone sent me that, that there was the study in New York the phone setting, because you use it like most of the day, plays a role on, on that, like on you thinking in English and all of that. So I was like, okay, challenge accepted. I'm changing my phone to Arabic. Of course, it was a nightmare. Like for, for a good three months, it was an ultimate nightmare. Uh, not only do we think in English, and it was hard for me to know the vocabulary of new terms that had never existed before in Arabic, but also like Everything we do is left to right. You swipe left to right. So when you switch the language, you realize you're thinking again right to left. So when you look at the screen, we, because we all have our settings on English, or most of us, you will look left. But after a while of having it in Arabic, I look right and I notice the difference between me and my kids now. Like even when Mathen, I had a list of words in Arabic written on a board and I asked my daughter to write that she chose to, read, to write that word on the left first. <laughs> so I was like, no, no, no. In Arabic, you look right. But... It's so deeply ingrained in us, and we and and it, and it was a lot of work. And I remember when I decided, like, I'm going to start speaking in Arabic more and all of that. I started getting so frustrated to speak in English, and I don't want that to happen. I want us to be able to speak fully in English and fully in Arabic. Mm -hmm. um, and I can read kind of Pascal's mind when 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 Maryam was. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I like to feel like I can read people's minds. <laughs> But I feel like when, when, when uh, Maryam was talking about speaking in Arabic and more like the importance of more Arabic content, uh, it, I thought of it and I thought Pascal might have thought of it too, is the, 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 the dialects um, issue and the fusha issue. Yeah. Yeah. So, like one of the things that leads people to speak in English is when you have a group of Arabs from different parts of the Arab world where they don't necessarily understand each other's accents or sometimes worse, point out or make fun of each other's accents. So they choose to speak in English instead. How do we promote, um, you know, how do we make Arabic unify us rather than disconnect us? Where you know, It's so much easier for a kid to just choose English to avoid bullying, you know what I mean? Rather than to be interested enough to learn and admire those differences. Like when you look into the Arabic words and the different accents uh, or dialects, some words, Although they use a different Arabic word, sometimes, okay, some, some accents ha have original words from India or from France or from whatever, but some originate from Arabic, but we're using, we choose to use different terms and that's when it becomes interesting. Looking at the root of the word and why did this nation choose this word to describe this feeling over this other, other country? Um, it's always interesting, like, do we do, we do more uh, content in, uh, in, in, in our accent, like in Saudi, for example, why is it okay to do a podcast in Saudi versus publish a book in a Saudi accent? Like you won't feel the same and you will be more comfortable listening to a podcast in a Saudi accent, but maybe some people will give hate to a book published in, in a Saudi accent or a Lebanese accent. Uh, no, no, absolutely. I think, I think that's a very interesting way of putting it. And you know, the book has to be, any, a published matter has to be very different than an, uh, an auditory or a video kind of content. And I think it's, it's, the, it's something we, we said in our previous conversations about this idea of uniting us all. Yani, yeah. We can all read it. And and it means that I can read as yeah, I can read your book as a Saudi, let's say, author and afama 
um, maybe not necessarily understand it if it was written in a dialect in, 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 the, in a colloquial uh, form. And there's also as well the word, the published word. And we find this also in English. And it's very rarely that you will pick up a book that doesn't have dialects between parentheses, right? Because it's it's part of a conversation or part of a quote or a hiwar or a, or a, or a dialogue between the main um, protagonist and someone else. And sometimes uh, but, in English yeah. books, they actually describe the accent because sometimes you're reading it in your own Fact. accent. So like he's speaking Fact. in this kind of heavy accent. So I yeah. feel, I feel like I used to be very against it, by the way, but the more I dig into it, the more I become very open about the idea of publishing more stuff in different dialects. Mm. We all understand yeah. Egyptian because it's, there's so much content, like videos. And the, and the prominence of the media, يعني, we grew up and the media, يعني, يعني, all of the shows and the masrahiyat and the musalsalat and, and the aflam that we've watched were in the Egyptian dialect. And to a certain extent, Baden is Suri, Baden is Lebanani. But the Masri was prominent. So that's why, Hatta during the, the protests uh, that um, the Arab Spring in 2011, 2010, even our, like, we've related so much to the written uh, boards in Libya, Tahrir, because we understood the humor, we understood the context. And the relationship is very strong with the Masri. Um, جداً جداً and it's because of the dominance of the media. Um, I did a bit of a research on this like 10 years ago, this idea of Lahja al-Masri and why it's so prominent. But I, I see in Saudi, you guys are amazing in that. يعني, الدعايات, ال, um, advertising, ال campaigns, حتى the Twitter accounts. يعني, and for me, when I want to really enjoy my time on Twitter, I follow brands that exist everywhere in the world, but the Saudi Twitter yeah. account. Yeah, because it's... it's the, it's phenomenal you know and it's not just the accent the culture absolutely absolutely only people like even by the way you know it's funny even within saudi the campaigns in jeddah are very different different than the ones in riyadh unbelievable like saudi is another world well i'm dying to explore how so lujain how how are they different i mean i'm sorry i'm like putting on the side how's it different for example noon had a campaign and not muscle gawamin gawam is a very hijazi word i don't even use like Uh maybe use this but they would no way have this in the art. There's, there, there's no way. Mm-hmm. Someone here, Lean, yeah, Lean, she said in a clubhouse, and I agree, clubhouse, like the groups, they all speak in their own, like everyone's speaking in Arabic. It's so refreshing. Yeah. You know, obviously, it's very all the hype right now. It's very refreshing to join and hear people speak like you. And you, 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 even by the way, in the Saudi group, there would be like a Lebanese guy and he'll talk in his accent. It was so refreshing. Yeah. And then someone speaks Shuya English and it was fine. I don't see no one's judging. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. yeah um, I do. I do understand the the importance of the of the Fusha as the link of all the Arab nations, but I am I tend to be a bit towards the idea that it kills also the diversity and the culture of every specific uh, nation. Just just as a reference, as an as, as an example, here in Spain. I knew this uh, since I came here before, I didn't know. Before, before coming to Spain, I thought everyone spoke Spanish because maybe I was ignorant about, uh, about the languages, which is the Castellano, but actually there's five official languages. And in every region, there's five different regions in Spain and there's five languages and, and there's the Catalan, the Basque, the, the Gallego, et cetera. And actually there's so many literature and so many programs and books that published in specific kind of uh, languages and this is only one nation and they have the like the, the other tra- translations happening or there's like some movies that are different uh, slangs whatever and uh, the arab nation is is is, is huge it's like all the middle east and north africa and even even beyond and i think i am i tend to be on the, on the other side that yes okay the the fusha unites us but also i i, I think the fusha is somehow uh, killing us as a, as a diverse kind of culture. Uh, imagine all of Europe or imagine all of uh, Africa. They are speaking in the same language and the same script. It's not, it's, not, it's not visual, it's not even logical. So why, why do we all the Arabs from North Africa to Middle East, which is a huge, we need to all speak in the same uh, language. It's not, it's not mandatory and translating is easy somehow, I think, especially now in the, in the modern age. And I would like to see more 
publications in Le in like Lebanese and like like the slang Lebanese or more uh, uh, whatever it is books uh, movies uh, songs or we spoke we spoke briefly before about how the the publishers or the creative uh, music industries that decided to do stuff in Arabic, especially in Lebanese or in uh, Saudi or Emirati, they became more famous than yeah. the ones that stuck to the Fusha. And uh, I don't know if you want us to name some of them, but uh, feel free to we, we can and name we play but... for <laughs> at the beginning of the, of the yeah, episode, like, we like so many, like, I like, I, I can name some few from, from the Lebanese uh, 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 community. Like, for example, in the music industry, we all know about Mashra Leila, and, and also we know about Tanya Saleh, and we know about uh, so many others. And these uh, artists or singers, uh, they, they decided to do it in the Lebanese slang. They didn't want to sing in the Fusha like all the other uh, Arab pop artists. And, and at the beginning, everyone was telling them like, you are going to be fail, no one's going to listen to you. What? Uh, uh, it's going to be only like very local, very small. And then these actually were the kind of creatives that they became internationally known. And also in like in the publishing sector, like for kids, we have like, for example, Dar Umbos, they said we're going to do it only in Lebanese slang. And also they were fought yeah. by all the other publishing houses and then they were proven wrong again. And so many others. Uh, I, uh, I say, and now we are speaking about the negative space. Why, why there, there isn't a negative space or there is a space that every nation can legalize its own dialect into a certain written language and keep the Fusha also. Why, why don't we have a Lebanese language and the Fusha language? Why don't we have the Saudi language and the Fusha language? Why don't we have the Egyptian language and the Arabic language? Written, it's written down it's with difficult. its own grammar, with its I, own... I, I, I but it's very difficult. This would be amazing. No, 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 no but yani, mesela, you it's take like, Iraq. <laughs> sorry, so, sorry, but... Even one country, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. Also, also exactly. it makes it, it, uh, sorry, sorry, before I give you, I, I, yeah, now I made like a big bomb and now it's going to... <laughs> Uh, the other point is that that I find difficult is is the teaching, especially for 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 kids. And now also that now also I'm I'm teaching my my kid. It's very hard to, and also I see myself. I I struggled as a kid with the Arabic, and, I, and now I see also my 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 nieces and and um, my kid at some point. They uh, compared to the Arabic French, they learn to read and speak in the same way. But in Arabic, we don't learn that. We learn to read and write differently than what we want to speak. And this is very confusing, uh, I think, as a, as a person or as a, or as a kid. And it was very hard for me as a person when I was a kid. And I see it now with, with younger people. So why, 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 why not a Lebanese student in Lebanon would learn Lebanese and also on the side, uh, they can learn also Fusha for the more a serious kind of, I don't know if this is possible or not, but imagine here, for example, in Spain, they learn, for example, Catalan, like people in Barcelona, they learn Catalan and they learn the Castellano. And people in, in Galicia, they learn uh, Gallego and the, the Castellano. The Castellano is the, is the Spanish that everyone knows. And then they learn also their own slang or language. It's not a slang, it's their own language. That's only spoken by few millions in this region only. But they learn it at school, and there's a lot of publication about it. So, but but this, why not? this brings it's, up it's, it's but, but this brings up a lot of socio political issues as well because what yeah, also, the course. Lebanese yeah. right accent like yeah. is it the Beiruti one or is it the one from the Janoub? Well, is it the one from Trablus? You know because they speak differently. <laughs> like if you come to Iraq, <laughs> the uh, the prominent accent that everybody um, like loves and like you know whenever I speak it, they're like oh Kadam Sahar Majid Mohandas. That accent is 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 uh, washed a very like very very watered down Baghdadi accent, mine and not theirs. But uh, Ani Aslan from Mosul, and our accent, if I speak it now, it's very much understandable but it sounds nothing like the Baghdadi accent. And the Lahja from Bas Basra sounds nothing like the Baghdadi. So what, then there, there's an issue of what is the Iraqi accent, right? And this is already yeah, a socio-political like tension yani, or geographical tension. And why is it that we, um, we, we put so much prominence on the 
the capital, like the capital is the narrative, right? Like any, mm-hmm. we, when you talk Iraq, you say Baghdad. When you talk Syria, you say Dimashq, like Halab doesn't matter or like Mosul doesn't matter. And same goes for Saudi. So there are already these tensions within these countries. And I think that's why and I am for it had to remain a unifying yeah. language that we can all read and we never speak Fusha. and hatta when it comes to popular culture and I see what you're saying about Mashroa Leila and I'm a fan but yani, ihna, we grew up listening to Um Kalthum and from our parents and Abdul Halim Hafiz and and then grow and Amr and and, 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 and and these are with like both right it, okay not Amr Diyab but you know, or Hakim yani, but, you know, yeah, but you know, the, the likes of Kadam Sahar, Um Kalthum, Fairuz, they sing with both um, <laughs> but they sing that the Pusha poetry, which becomes like this very operatic kind of like grandeur kind of music. And then there's the uh, you know, like it's, it's, there is that dialect in the colloquial kind of thing. But I, I see what you're saying. Maybe, maybe the way to do it, and I don't have children, but if I do, I'll do that. And one of the conversations I have with my husband is, what are they going to speak, Iraqi or Lebanese? Mm. Because he's Lebanese, I'm Iraqi, and I know they will speak Iraqi 100%. You always follow the mother's <laughs> accent, you don't follow the father's. But still, like I think maybe we can instill in our children the love of popular culture in Arabic. Whether it was plays, movies, um, cartoons, inshallah, we're waiting for Lujain to produce uh, our <laughs> first Arabic cartoon. I, I'm, I'm waiting for that. But anyway, like good quality cartoons, but... I think that's where you get the accent and then, or you perfect the colloquial, but then you have the yeah. fusha, which will allow you to access this amazing world of knowledge. I mean, yeah. this is again- But I'm not saying that I want to cancel the fusha. I'm not saying- No, no, I, I, know, I know what it. you're saying. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, will stay, it will stay as the, as the main cultural, <laughs> educational, <laughs> but, but, but also to, to, to make the other uh, languages, uh, uh, and actually what we did together and actually what this, the, the viewers now are seeing behind us is only the, the, the word marhaba, how it can be said by different kind of uh, people from different nations. And it's not only about different slang, it's about different language. Like we said, like the word marhaba might come from the, from the Syri- uh, Syriac, like it's more like the Crescent area, they, they maybe use it. It's coming from the Syriac, et cetera. And others come from the, more the early Arabic or different, or so there's or different Babylonian. roots actually. There's this, uh, yeah, there's it like either Syriac or Babylonian or Arabic or uh, whatever. So it's, it's, it's not only about the accent, it's sometimes about the whole structure of a certain language. And I'm just saying, well, why not? It, 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 it might make life easier for, for the kids at least and for you the common that. common common life and and alia and i were thinking it's like saying you have latin you have latin and from this latin language you have french italian spanish maybe on a, on a, on a smaller scale but i'm um, yeah. just to make a comparison or but this also exists everywhere like i spoke about spain but also if you go if you speak about india if you speak about china if you, if you speak about korea like uh I don't know the numbers, but like in, in India, I'm sure there's like a, a, a handful of languages that are spoken and not even languages, there's even different kinds of scripts that, that, uh, that are used. And also in China and also in Korea and, and they all uh, use them. They, there's, there, maybe, maybe there's one more dominant because it's more popular, but it, it doesn't cancel the others. They, yeah. They have they have access to all or different these languages uh, and if you want to do like a typeface now like now I'm starting to understand a bit more scripts because uh, we at Mental Letters we are I'm I'm trying to collaborate with other uh, people from other world to do other scripts than Arabic and Latin and now I'm thinking okay what about uh, trying to go to I feel to like we scripts? can have like a whole to, conversation I'm, about I'm this. To, like dedicated only to kind of unpacking everything that has to do with language adaptability, developing hacks to make it more accessible, more relevant yeah. and colloquial. But I'm anyway, sorry. I hate to kind of shift gears because I'm conscious of time and I'm, you know, I'm mm-hmm. glad for every, that a lot of our members have stuck around. This is dragging a bit longer because the conversation is so great. Um, I want to bring it back to design. I want us to kind of put ourselves back um, through like looking at this through the lens of design, understanding what negative space is about. Um, you guys touched upon a lot of interesting things. Um, 